on the word on the actual key. So this is the first one. What do we want on the first one? First of all, do y'all understand transformer ratio? I thought we did that in the class. What's that five to one mean? Yeah, for every five turns on the uh, primary, we have one turn on the secondary. Uh, so what we do is uh, come up here. We take uh, so my uh, v uh, v primary would be equal to 120 volts divided by five. So what's that? So y'all understand where that came from? And usually transformers are always to one, something to one, something to one. So uh, you take. If, it's, if if the big number is on the right hand side, you multiply by that number. If it's on the left hand side, you do what? You divide by. It. So what does that give me? Uh, Twenty four volts. Okay. Uh, then I need to calculate VP. So VP would be equal to twenty four divided by point seven oh seven. Yeah, this, we call this VP secondary. I think that's where just to get it straight. So what we got? 33.95. This is both peak, but this is on the secondary. Uh, then we calculate what we call VP out. Uh, this is going to be equal to 33.95 minus 0.7. Take out for the dial drop. What's that giving? Yeah, 33.25. And then my Volts DC is going to be equal to uh, V peak out 3.325 divided by 3.14. And this will be with basically our output. Yeah, but it's still DC. But it is technically an average, right? You understand because it's it's going to be what I measure. It's what's going to be is so. If I put a light bulb on this, what's the light bulb going to see? Whatever this answer is. So what's the answer? What's that? So that's what the light bulb will see. That's what a resistor would see. If I if I calculated the wattage on the resistor, that's what the resistor would see, right? You understand that? A motor, a, a 10 mo, a 10 mo DC motor would run fine on this as long as we met the requirements for the current of it. What else do we need y'all to calculate? Is there anything else? Okay, so my I, my IL would be equal to uh, 10.6 uh, divided by 1K. Now we're, now we're into DC, right? Which would give us what? <laughs> A milliamp, right? Anything else? Uh, power. So power. We could use two formulas. We could use I square R. We could use V square over R. We could use I times R, uh, I times V. It don't make any difference. So uh, P of the load would be equal to 10.6 milli times 10.6. And what would that give us? 12 milliwatts. So where do we run into problems at? Most of you didn't run into problems down here. You learned this one. So you can use I square over R. I'm sorry, I square R, I square times R, or V square over R, whichever form you want to use, you come up with the same answer. So okay, everybody okay? Any questions on that? Yes or no? So the volt average and the VDC. That's the same. same thing.
I could have called it DC out. But technically, it is an average. And why is that? Because it's doing this right here. So this gives me a 2V peak over a D peak over pi. And then I average that with what? Zero. <laughs> this gives me 2V peak over pi. And then I average that with what? Zero. So that's where we come up with the formula uh, V peak over pi for half wave. For the average DC, for the DC, and the, so when your meter, you got to understand what is your DC, what does your meter give you? It gives you the average, right? That's what it gives you. And that's what it does when you read, when you measure peak, when you measure RMS. It's what we don't call it an average because we don't calculate the way we calculate an average. Uh, we call it RMS because it's the root of the means of the squares, right? You understand that? So we don't call that an average, just so you don't get them confused. We call that, the, that's technically called the effective voltage. Mr. what's that weird top of it? Yeah, VPRI. Primary. That's over here. But that's not right. This should be VP secondary. V secondary. Yeah, that's that's the voltage we're getting out of secondary. So we're putting 120 volts in here, and we're getting uh, 24 volts RMS right there. But remember, we don't use RMS to calculate average the DC average voltages. We use the peak, right? You understand? Are we okay? So 24 volts RMS would give us what 33 uh, 33.95 volts peak. Uh, we call this D peak out, which would be 33.25 volts D peak, uh, which gives us an average voltage of 10.6 volts DC. Right? Are we okay? Okay, so we are now, right? So this one gets everybody confused because they they don't understand a center tap transformer. On a center tap transformer, what you do is you're only using one half of the secondary at one time. So when I come over here, first of all, I calculate D peak on my second uh, V on my secondary. I'm gonna take 120 volts and I'm gonna divide that by two, which gives me what? 60. Now that 60 volts is all the way across here. Right, you understand? Yes or no? Okay. So my V peak secondary for my high on my half wave is going to be 60 divided by 2, which so we're going to use 30 volts for all of that. Biggest problem there is people use what? They use 60. Are we okay? Yes or no? Are you saying the sixty on both sides? When we give when we give the voltage across of a center tap transformer, we give it all the way across it. So if they gave you the if you was at home and they said, okay, what do we have? What 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 do we have up on that power pole? You got a two hundred and forty volt center tap transformer. That's what's up on your power pole up there. But what it is, it's center tap. So that means if I come over here and this is up on my power pole and I'm center tap and I say I have a 240 volt center tap transformer, that's 240 volt center tap right there. But I'm only using right here, right? So I'm only using half of the transformer. So what would the half of the transformer be? 120 volts. So that's where you get your two voltages. If they use the whole transformer, you get 240 volts. If they go between the center tap, you get what, 120 volts, and that's the way your house is what. So we got an option of two voltages, right? We got a higher voltage available off the center tap transformer, and then we got a lower voltage. Uh, by the way, you need to stagger these. So you don't need to put, so if you notice the circuit breaker panel, it's got two sides on there, right? You understand that? 240 makes no difference. But these 120 volts, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to stagger them on each side. So if you got five on this side, you should, put it, you should have 120 volt five on that side, right? You understand as close as you can get that. Because if you don't, you're going to be loading one side of the transformer down. You'll see people add circuit breakers and they'll put them on the left-hand side. 
And what's happening now, you're doing what? You're overloading one of your uh, half of your transform. So try to stagger those. I mean, sometimes it don't work out. So sometimes you might have five on this side and four on that side, but that's the best, that's the best you could possibly do. So we're using a 24, we're using what we call a 60 volt, volt center tab transformer. That's the way the thing's going to be rated. So if you go all the way across the outside, you would get 60 volts, but we're not going all the way across the outside because we're using the center tap, right? You understand? Me? So we're only using one half of the secondary. Everybody okay? Now you could skip a step. You can stay 120 divided by four. And you get the same answer, right? You understand? Me? That's seven. But in our, in our trainer, sometimes we're not going to use the center tap, sometimes we do. But if you're using a full wave center tap rectifier, you've got to use a center tap transform, right? You understand that? Your full wave bridge, you've got quite off, you got quite a few options there. Uh, you can go all the way across the outside, you can go across one, you could have two, you could have a negative and a positive, right? You understand? You've got a lot of different options there. Uh, so everybody okay? So V peak secondary would be equal to 30 divided by 0 0.707, which would give us what? 42.43 volts peak. And if you round to one decimal point, you'll still get the same answers, right? I mean, uh, V peak, we call this V peak out. This is after our diodes. Uh, this should be 42.43 minus 0.7. Now, why, even though I've got two diodes, why do we only subtract one diode? Only one of them is being used at a time, right? So what does that give me? 41.7. Okay. And this is a P. You should put a P out there because this is no longer RMS. Uh, then we can calculate our DC output, both DC would be equal to uh, 2 times 41.7. You can do that divided by 3.14. And what would that give us? Point six. Yeah, that's good. And so I calculate my voltage of my idle load. This is a, uh, so I take 26.6 uh, divided by 1K. 1K makes a really good shunt because uh, it's 1 milliamp per volt. Uh, so 26.6 milliamps. And then P of the load would be equal to 26.6 milli times. 26.6 volts. Yeah, we didn't do that yet. So this is negative. Why is it negative? Good point. Yeah, the cathode is pointing towards source. There's no such thing as a negative current. There's no such thing as a negative wattage. You get the same wattage and you get the same current. Right, you understand. It's just that the current is flowing in the opposite direction. So we don't have a negative current, we have a negative voltage. So the only one that gets a sign, the only one that gets a sign is this guy right here. There's no such thing as a negative current, right? You understand? Because it's a it's a flow, it's not it's not in a direction, it is a flow, right? And we got to understand that a negative, a negative 26.6 volts will create exactly the same work that what? A positive 26.6 volts. It would run a light bulb. Light bulbs don't have, don't care about polarity. It'll run a motor. Motor does, uh, DC motors does, uh, 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 the motor would create the same work, but it would run in the opposite direction, right? You understand? 
So the polarity you put on the armature of a DC motor would determine the direction or the direction control, the, the direction flow through the motor. Because we can we can control the direction flow even though we don't have a negative supply. So that's a good question too. A lot of people want to put their current in flow. A negative and they want to put negative power. That would be pretty neat if I could come up with negative power, wouldn't it? So man, I go out there and wire my house up for negative power and then Alabama power would be paying me. <laughs> Which they do. You know, big companies like U.S. Steel, they have their own generators. Uh, they they take the gases that come off their blast furnace. They used to take the gases that came off. Of course, they don't have blast furnace anymore. Uh, they take the glasses, uh, gases that came off the coke works, and they, they would burn it in their boilers and create their own power. So they had power houses, out, power stations, power plants out there. And if they produce more than Alabama Power does, they would sell it back. Of course, that never was true. I put pulse frequency on this guy would be 120. Uh, so pulse frequency. No, it's a, this is full wave. So the output pulse frequency would be. Uh, this is. I think it says it should have said that on the board. Oh, you mean the input frequency? Yeah, I need to put that on there. Thank you. Uh, so if the input is 60, uh, then the pulse frequency would be 120 hertz. That was my thought. I should have put that on the on the worksheet. Yeah, that's all of them. All of them is 60. Yeah, if it's if it's full wave, it's twice the input frequency, right? If it's half wave, it's equal to the input frequency. Thanks a lot. I need to put that on the worksheet. So are we okay? Yes or no? Well, what we look at is we look at what's going on. So what is a cycle? One repetition of a repetitive waveform. So if I look at half wave, oops, I don't want to raise guys. So if I look look at half wave, here's a cycle coming in. Now that would be a cycle. Well, that's a cycle too. It's a repetition. So I've got a positive alternation. It goes negative. It goes to zero. I have a positive alternation. So we notice that the pulsating frequency is at exactly the same frequency as my watt, as my input, right? You understand that? Now I get over this guy right here, and my input is doing this. So my output is doing this. Okay, but when I look at my input, here's one cycle for my input. There's a positive, there's the negative, right? You understand? There's the positive, there's the negative, right? You understand? So here's one cycle, here's one cycle for my AC, here's one cycle for my pulsating DC. Because it's one repetition, right? You understand? Uh, so these pulses are going to be occurring every uh, 8.3 milliseconds, uh, where these pulses are going to be occurring every 16.7 uh, milliseconds. Now, where that comes into play, of course, is when you try to figure out your capacitor, what your capacitor is going to do when you filter, right? Are we okay? So here, the output pulse frequency would be. Uh, so my B secondary is going to be equal to 120 divided by 8. What's that? And then my VP secondary is going to be equal to 15 divided by 0.707. Okay. 
why don't we use half here? Well, we're using the whole transform, right? Understand that. So even if I came over here and did this, since that center tap's not connected, then we're still using the whole transform. So well, what we do is we look at uh, what do we consider to be our comp? The bottom of the resistor. What's the top? So the top of the resistor sets the polarity. So that means these two guys right here are setting the polarity. Their cathodes are pointing toward the transformer, so this would be a negative. Everybody okay? Yeah, this is my load right here. This is what we're concerned with. What polarity is the load going to set? So what we do is we establish one side as being common. Of course, this, that's a ground. This would be a common, right, without the dashes. So if I was going to measure between here and here with my voltmeter, this is a real good question. Uh, what would my voltmeter show me? Would it show me positive or would it show me negative? Well, what we're doing is we're trying, we're trying to see, okay, let's, let's just follow the current flow. All right. Uh, so when this right here is positive and this right here is negative, uh, which two are turned on? Where would the current flow go if we follow the negative? So let's follow the negative. Where's it going to go? Is it going to go down? Can't go down because it's a negative, right? So it's going to go up. So here comes my negative polarity. It goes through the resistor, comes down. So the top of the load would be what? Negative. Are we okay? And then we'll follow uh, the next alternation. I'll use a different color. So the next one, this will be plus and this will be minus. I'm sorry. <laughs> this will be minus and this will be plus. So that means uh, this minus is going to come out here. It's going to turn this guy here on. Here goes my minus. It flows up through here, comes over, comes down, comes over. Right? You understand? Follows this wire right there. That's why a lot of people don't see that as a wire. It is a wire, right? You understand? And I can't tell you how many times I've heard, I thought that was connected in the train. <laughs> so they'll have a resistor out here, and they won't have anything. They'll have something plugged into this side, but they have nothing plugged into the other side. They say, well, I thought it was in the trainer, but it's not. That's a symbol that we use to represent a conductor, right? You understand that? So it'd flow up through here, uh, go back. It's looking for the what? It's looking for the pl plus. So, uh, sorry. So it'd flow back up to this guy, right? And go back up to, I'm wrong thing. Go up right here and go back to that side. So these two guys right here, these are the ones that we're looking at that's setting the polarity of the load. The one that's connected to the uncommon side, right? See what that? So the one that's connected to the, the side that is not common, that's the one that says polarity. So when I look at those two guys, the cathodes are pointing back toward the source, right? So that makes this a negative wow, That's a really good wow, that's a really good question. And I know we looked at that when we went over it, but I don't know if I explained it like that. I can't remember. So this would be a negative supply. Everybody see that? Are we okay? Okay, so what's 15 divided by 0 0.707? 21.2 volts P. And we've got VP out, uh, which would be equal to 21.2 minus 1.7. I mean, sorry, 1.4. Because every time it goes through two diodes, right? So what does that give me? What's that? I can't hear you. Nineteen point eight. Nineteen point eight. Okay. Now let's pick it out. Then my votes DC would be equal to uh, all these are one K by the way, nineteen divided by one K would be equal to 19.8 uh, milliamps 
and then my oops i'm sorry what am i doing i'm, I'm getting ahead of myself guys i'm sorry yeah i'm ahead of myself so my volts dc would be equal to 2 times 19.8 divided by 3.14 what does that give me Twelve point six volts DC. Yes, yeah, gonna be negative. We okay? Uh, then I the load would be equal to uh, twelve point six, the absolute value, right? Divided by one k, which give us uh, twelve point six milli amps. Then my power, my load would be equal to twelve point six milli. Uh, times 12.6 uh, volts and then my pulse frequency would be equal to 120 hertz so hertz is not a term we strictly use for AC hertz is a term we use for any repetitive wavelength So we okay? So we're okay. Ms. Richard, he said on the VC count, green one was subtracted by 1.4, but it went through two diodes. Yeah, it went through two diodes. So your full wave bridge, you're going to, you're going to lose two, wave, two diode drops on the full wave bridge because it has the flow through two diodes. Now, what advantage does the full wave bridge have over uh, a, a, a full wave center tap? Florida. It don't require center tap transformers. Center tap transformers cost more than regular transformers. Multi winding transformers cost more than single winding transformers. But it would still be cheaper than using two transformers, right? So a single a single uh, winding transformers are cheaper than single. So even though we use more diodes, diodes are cheap compared to transformers. I think the transformer for the trainer costs us it's over a hundred bucks. But it's got how many windings? Four four windings? Three or four. So if I bought three if I bought three transformers, it would cost more, right? You understand, than a, than a multi winding transformer. So when, when engineers are designing things, they're not designing it. For how much it costs to repair, they're designing it for how much it costs costs to build, right? You understand? So that's why they use these integrated bridge rectifiers all the time, uh, because they're cheaper than buying four diodes. But if if it goes out, you got to replace all four of them, right? You understand? So they're more expensive to repair, but they're less expensive to engineer. So that's, uh, that's the first worksheet. So the next worksheet is a little more, a little more complicated because now we're, we're talking a filter. So these are our filtered, unregulated power supplies. So what do we mean by what do we mean by unregulated? That sounds like a really good test question. What do we mean by unregulated? Huh? Yeah, but we need to know what unregulated means. I mean, what does unregulated mean? Yeah. 
Well, it, it, it could be steady. If I gave it the exact input and I had the exact current load, it would be steady as a rock. Unregulated means it varies with varying conditions, right? You understand? So I come over here and in here we might measure 121 volts on my input. Uh, I, I might get home and I might have 115 volts. Well, if my input voltage changes, then my output voltage changes on these power supplies, right? You understand? If I come up here and change the load, if I change the load, then the if I add more, if I demand more current, then my capacitor discharges faster. If I require less current on my load, then my capacitor discharges slower. So what happens on power supplies, your output varies with it changing input voltages and changing load currents. But they're real cheap to make. So if I can get by with stuff like DC motors, DC motors might run a little slower, right? But still they'll run at a speed that's respectable. Light bulbs, uh, you know, uh, will give us almost the same intensity because light bulbs are automatically rated over range anyway. So here what we need to figure is we need to calculate something called so our 2V peak over pi is gone, right? You understand it. It is gone because this guy here is not pulsing to zero. So the formula for the output of this thing, volts DC, is V peak out uh, minus V ripple peak peak uh, divided by 2. That's the formula here. And that should be uh, in your, uh, this, this should be T C guys. Uh, huh? Yeah. But it should be under, uh, I got them split up, unfiltered power supplies, filtered power supplies, right? It should be in the filtered power supplies section. So both DC would be equal to V peak out of minus V ripple peak peak. So first thing I need to do is calculate V peak out. So uh, both secondary, uh, not by 10, but I'm divided by 4. Because that's the ratio of the transformer. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, let's get back to number one. It just slows again. Wow. So you're right. Thank you. So, uh, V, V out, uh, secondary would be equal to 120 divided by 10, which would give you what? 12 volts, right? And then V peak, uh, secondary, would be equal to 12 divided by 0 0.707. What does that give me? This is halfway, so we don't. Or 17 volts. Uh, then B peak out would be equal to 17 minus. 0.7. We can do that, right? 16.3. And this is peak. This is peak. Okay. So what we do, uh, and this is what I told y'all, it's gonna it's gonna make our calculations just slightly off. But we got so many. Uh, so uh, my diode has tolerances, right? My transformer has tolerances. My capacitor has a tolerance. My, my uh, resistor has a tolerance. So what we'll use to, to get an approximation of my load current, or in fact, I gave you my load current. So I think every one of these I gave you the load current. But if I don't give you the load current, then you can approximate it. Uh, you can say I the load is equal to V peak out divided by RL. This is approximately, right? So I gave you all the actual currents here. So what do we need to do, guys? We need to calculate for V ripple peak peak. I'm listening. Well, we're not even that far yet. 
Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Ten? Oh, wow. I cut and pasted. I thought I cut and pasted right out of the little worksheet. Ten milliamps. We'll use ten milliamps. That's fine. So, what's the formula? What's that? Yeah, I equals. Yeah. Are we okay? Uh, so here I would use uh, 10 milliamps divided by 100 micro uh, times 60 hertz. Now, y'all know y'all run to use parentheses, right? In your calculator. So, you're going to have to use your parentheses on your calculator because if you don't, what people will do is they'll, they'll say 10 milli divided by 100 microfarads times 60. Well, what's going to do is going to take the answer and multiply it times 60, right? You understand? So I'd come up here and I'd say 10 milli uh, to minus third, right? And then I'd do what? I'd say divided by, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to open parentheses, and I'm going to say 100 micro times 10 to the minus 6 uh, times 60. Then I'll close my parentheses and hit equals. 1.7 volts. Are we okay? 1.7 volts. 1.6666. Big pig, right? Uh, then my DC, my volts DC would be equal to D peak out 16.3 minus. 1.7 divided by 2. What's that? 15.5. By the way, if you if you was designing a power supply, what would be the thing parameters you would need to know? Size that capacity. Well, not a amount of motion, but let's just talk about the, the fairies. So how would we know how to size that? Now that's the big thing. How much current? How much current are you designing your power supply to handle? Right? You understand? So you need to make sure your transformer has the ability to put out that current. You need to make sure your diode has the ability to handle that current. And then of course you need to figure out what what farad capacitor you need. So what's the formula? C would be equal to what? I over what voltage, uh, what uh, ripple voltage you could handle. Uh, times L, right? So how much ripple can you handle? If you're going to use a regulator, you need to make sure your ripple is way above your watt, what you're trying to regulate at. Everybody understand that?
So this would probably work at a, a 10 volt supply, probably at a 12 volt supply too. Are we okay? Yes, there's no, there's no peak here. This is, this is DC. This is not pulsating DC. This is DC. But what we're going to have is we're going to have our DC is going to look like this. And then, of course, down here, this is going to be zero now. It's never going to go to zero. The only time this circle will go to zero is when you turn it off. Huh? Well, yeah, because it's still it's still doing this. So if I was to look at my uh, my input, of course, like since this is half wave, uh, uh, it would look like this, right? So it's going to charge up on every pulse and then it's going to discharge when we're down here at what zero so here your ripple frequency and your and your pulsating frequency is going to be exactly the same so it's going to be twice per full wave so i got one or two options uh, if my frequency goes up and i'm trying to get the same thing what side what's going to happen to c It's on the bottom on the right hand side, so what's going to happen here? So if frequency goes up, then the size of my capacitor is going to go down. So full wave, and that's another advantage of full wave, is that your capacitors can be smaller. And that's one of the things that determines the cost of a capacitor is the number of farads it's rated at, and of course it's working voltage. That determines the size. So the, the more voltage it's got to block, the bigger it's going to be, right? You understand, because the plates are going to have to be separated further. Uh, and also, uh, uh, the number of farads, this is farads, this is not frequency. Yet. And the number of farads. So a 100 microfarad 25 volt capacitor would cost less than a 100 microfarad 50 volt capacitor, right? You understand that? So as your voltage goes up, as your voltage rating goes up, the cost of the capacitor goes up. So this is why when you figure this out, you want to get the best farads. And the rule of thumb is to double this, right? Yeah, and you double the capacitance and you double the working load. Because when you have lightning, transformers try to uh, attenuate voltage spikes. That's one thing good about transformers, but they still can get through. So, is this 500 mica? Is 500 milli okay on this one? Okay, I don't know. So, like I said, I, I went into the worksheet. Let me agree. I don't know who's going to fix it, but on the first one, Yeah, we did. We decided to sit right down. It's the same as it, this is halfway, so it's going to be 60 hertz. Okay, the clarity of capacitor. What's this guy for? So this is pointing back towards the source, so my capacitor, my polarity is going to be plus. All these are going to be, by the way, all these are going to be polarized capacitors. So we have unpolarized capacitors, but these are usually down in the in the in the peak of farads. Once we get up to the farads, then usually they go to a polarized capacitor so they can reduce the size of the capacitor. So what they do is they have one metal that wants to accept the electrons and another metal that wants to wants to store holes, right? You understand? And what happens if you reverse it, then you have you have current flow through voltage and you create blow-ups, right? And I think uh, the over the over voltage blew up a lot bigger than the reverse polarity. The reverse polarity still popped, but it didn't pop near as bad. So we okay? So for half wave, my ripple frequency is going to be the same as the input. For full wave, my ripple frequency is going to be twice. So my ripple frequency here is going to be 800 hertz.
and the polarity of my capacitor is going to be minus, right? Yeah, because the cathodes are pointing toward the source. So, yes. Normally, uh, normally we, and, and the problem is, uh, so usually on these radial lead capacitors, which means they come out on the bottom, on one side, so these are radial cooling capacitors. Normally what they do is they label the minus side. And I didn't draw this right. And what you'll probably notice is that the minus lead is shorter than the initial lead. Of course, you, you, you lose that identifier as soon as you clip the lead, right? The solder. In most of your uh, actual lead capacitors, for some reason, uh, what they do is they label the, they label the positive side. And I, and I didn't say always, I said what? Usually. But one of the leads is going to be identified and they take for granted, uh, you know, if you label one lead, they've only got two leads on them, right? If you, if, if you label one lead, then you take for granted the other one is the same, right? Are we okay? Yes or no? So we know two things right off the bat. We know this, this is a negative power supply, so we know we've got to turn the negative uh, on our capacitor toward uh, toward uh, the power, not the common lead. So uh, this is uh, center tapped. So V secondary, we got two calculations. We could do 120 divided by 4, but let's do the whole thing. So this is going to be 120, I mean, I'm sorry, divided by 8. What does that give us? What's that? 30 volts. Okay. And then I'm going to divide that by 2, which gives us what? 50. Uh, then my V peak secondary is going to be equal to 15 divided by 0.707, which gives me what? 21.2. And then my V peak out is going to be equal to 21.2. 21.2 minus 0.7. See if it's what? Uh, then my V ripple peak peak is going to be equal to. <coughs> 500 milli uh, divided by 1,000 well, 1, micro times 120. What's that? Could be. Wouldn't surprise me. Even though we've used the same key for a while. But. Point 0.5 divided by 1,000 times 10 to the minus 6 times 120. Close my parentheses. Okay. 4.2. It's a full wave rectifier.
Yeah. It's halfway. Okay. It's just like it's just like pulsa. It, it, it charges on the peaks, right? You understand? So here we got two peaks that it charges fully at, and they're 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 8.33 milliseconds apart. On half wave, the capacitor's got to run the load for 16.7 milliseconds, right? You understand? So here the capacitor's going to have to run the load uh, half half the time, so it's going to discharge slower, right? You understand that? Does that make sense? So when we deal with the frequency, on half wave, we're going to use whatever the input frequency is. And I'm sorry, somebody, uh, we screwed up. Thank y'all. Thank you, Milton. So Rich didn't pay any attention, right? So here we're going to use 800. So that's what you were saying? Yeah. And what does the key say? Six hundred twenty five millivolts. So if I was going to use, uh, if this was going to be 60 hertz, then it would be four point something volts, right? You understand that? So if the frequency goes up, then the capacitor has less time to do what? To discharge, right? You don't understand that? So my volts DC, thank you guys, would be equal to 20.5 minus, minus 625 milli divided by 2. So this, we're getting a really good guy on this, but it's 400 hertz. Now, where did I come up with the 400 hertz at? Well, the airplanes that I worked on in the Navy, that's what their generators were, 400 hertz. Yeah, 625. What's that? This is, uh, this is, uh, of course, 400, 400 hertz is a lot more expensive. Uh, this is why the planes cost thirty-two million dollars that I worked on, because there's nothing standard. Right? You understand? Everything that was made for the airplanes had to be made for the airplane. Yeah, because there's that, that would be the only reason. So, the sixty-cycle transformers are going to be a heck of a lot cheaper because why? Because they're all over the place. But four hundred hertz is more efficient than sixty hertz. Because now your capacitors can be a lot smaller, right? Your transformers can be more, a lot smaller. You don't have to have as many windings because the windings become more efficient, right? You understand why? Because the speed of the relative motion goes up. So that means we can have less turns and our, our transformers are smaller, everything's smaller. And that's what you're trying to do in an airplane is you're trying to make everything walk small and light, lightweight as you possibly can. But yeah, we run. I think I told you about the transformer story, right? Put a burn up. <laughs> yeah, I went into the parts locker and got a transformer. I was going to make me a power supply. And it was a 400, it was a 400 hertz transformer and I put 60 hertz on it. And uh, that made, that made your formula where X of L is equal, X of L is equal to 2 pi L L. So as soon as I dropped that voltage down, X of L went way down and that sucker pulled a lot of current. And it fired up. It smoked up the whole shop. Which was a funny story. So don't use a 400 cycle transformer in your, uh, in your house, right? Okay, what else did we need to calculate? Uh, the, the ripple frequency. Uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be 120 hertz, right? And I think that's all we, I'm sorry, 800 hertz. I'm, not, I'm doing it again. So I can.
twice the input frequency. Twice the input frequency. It's full wave. So it's just like half wave. We use twice the input frequency for 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 full wave, and we use the input frequency for half wave. It's just that here it's not pulsing the ground anymore, right? You understand? And that's important to know, guys, because we get these big old capacitors out there, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. Our output voltage is slightly lower than what it's supposed to be. Uh, so we come over here, we hook a we hook an oscilloscope up to it. And we measure the ripple frequency. If the fre rip ripple frequency is supposed to be 120 at 60, it means one of your diodes are open. If it's supposed to be 120, if it measures 120, then your diodes are doing what they want you to do. So now you'd say, okay, either I, either my transformer's not, not giving me my output voltage or my load is pulling more current than what the transformer's designed to deliver. So right off the bat, if you got, and this this is the problem we have, is that most people don't have one oscilloscope. So you get an output voltage that's that's lower than the first thing you would probably suspect is the diodes. So you turn it off and you check the diodes with your own meter. Uh, if it worked, if they're okay, then you would suspect the transformer, right? You understand? Or the load. So you'd probably measure the current in the load next. And if the current in the load was What's lower, it means that the problem's in the transformer, right? You understand that? If the current in the load is a lot higher than what it's supposed to be, then you try to figure out what's going on with your loads. And we run into a big, uh, a, a lot of problems in that a lot of, a lot of power supplies will have, uh, will have cutoff circuits in them, especially your switch mode power supplies. So if you try to get too much current out of them, they'll shut off, they'll shut off. <laughs> Are we okay there? Anything else we need to calculate? So the output voltage is going to be negative. Why is the output voltage negative? Because the cathode is pouring towards the source. So my output voltage is negative. It does not affect current, guys. Current flows, right? It does the same work whether it's pouring negative. It always flows negative to positive. It's not going to change the amount of work it does. Yeah, we'd have to make sure we put the what? The minus up here or the plus toward the common, whichever one's labeled. Like one of the leads is going to be labeled, right? You don't understand that. Are we okay? And if you put these guys in there backwards, these guys are going to pop on you, right? You understand? Because there's no protection. You're All you're dealing with is the resistance of the transformer. So this is sick. We're back to 60 hertz here. So what we got here, guys? Where do I start at? Yeah, so I'd say yeah. Uh, v secondary is going to be equal to 120 divided by four, which is going to give me what? 30. We're, we, we, it's not center tap, so we're then I calculate what we call V P secondary. Is going to be equal to what? 30 divided by 0.707, right? What did that give me? 42.4 volts peak. My peak peak peak. Uh, then my B peak out would be equal to 42.4 minus 1.4. 're well, pretty close to ignoring it by the way uh, because uh, I think the rule of thumb is 50 you think about 50 you ignore the diodes so what we got what's that yeah 41.
So then I can calculate my V replicate P would be equal to two over got a big capacitor here too, guys. Uh, Fifty thousand microfarads. Very expensive, but when you get to these high current power supplies, your capacitors are going to be really expensive. Times one hundred twenty. What's that? Now, why is the ripple voltage so low? Because of this guy right there, right? You understand? A 50,000 microfarad capacitor. Uh, so my volts, uh, my volts VC should be equal to 41 minus 333 milli divided by two. What's that? 41. 40. So if you calculated with 41, uh, you would probably be close enough, right? I'm sorry. If you calculated with this, uh, you'd still be close enough for. Uh, and the ripple boat, the frequency would be what? 120. So there's the worksheet, guys. You've got any questions on that? Everybody okay? Make sure. Yeah. So the the uh, I think there'll be three circuits on the test, and uh, it'll come off all these worksheets. So if you've done a lot of work these, you should be okay. Uh, there's blank worksheets up there, so you can go in there and you can run them off and just do them yourself, and then compare them to the, the key. On the do you want to label it B primary? I don't know what you mean. Like, you got a B primary, and then you got a spot that says B secondary. This is the primary. That's, so the primary is 120 volts AC. We calculate on the secondary. You understand? So the well, second. So I'm saying, so for instance, for that problem there, you got on the second, you got primary, so you took the 120 and divided it by the four. And then once you get the anti of that, then you put the secondary on the Yeah, this is, that's just a mistake. Okay. Yeah, all our calculations are done on the secondary side, not on the primary side. Are we okay? Okay, guys, y'all go ahead and take a break. Let me go get, I'm going to set up a full wave circuit, a filtered circuit.